Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new edition of EuroQuestion, the bi monthly webinar at the Jacques Delors Institute. Today, we have the pleasure to welcome Elvire Fabry, senior researcher at the Jacques Delors Institute in the geopolitics of trade. Ahead of the special European Council tomorrow and on Friday, how can we expect from the European Union response of the Inflation Reduction Act announced by the US President Joe Biden? Many Europeans consider this big initiative as an unfair competition. The European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has presented the details of the EU plan on the 1st February. As the French and the German economy minister were in Washington on Monday, to what extent should the EU subsidize the single market? Uh, before handing the floor to a speaker, I would just remind you that the Q&A tool is available at the bottom of your screen. El Rivier, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining this uh, Euro question. Well, I, I think that first, uh, first of all, before we go back to the assessment of the, 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 the European response to this Inflation Reduction Act, I think we have to go back to the broader picture of the, the evolution of the international uh, framework in which this debate is, is happening. Because of course the era is a booster for the engagement of the EU in, in the race for the development of green technologies and, and to, to speed the green transition, which is, which is a good news. But uh, the era is as much, uh, has as much a uh, climate objective as an anti-China objective. And, and uh, there's an increasing uh, rivalry, technological rivalry between the US and, and China, the so-called decoupling, which, which is going on. And with a very ambitious objective uh, on the US side, which is uh, to, to address the Chinese leader, the, the leadership that China has uh, in some, some certain sectors, like uh, for example, uh, electric vehicle, uh, but also to address its monopoly position in, in other sectors, like for the, the uh, production of uh, solar panels, uh, the refinery or strategic uh, minerals. And the objective now is not <clears throat> just to keep an advance, but to, to, to have the maximum distance between its own technological leadership and the Chinese uh, technological leadership. And when we, when we pay attention to the recent measures that have been adopted on the both sides, with the ban on the semicon US semiconductors, which could, uh, which could be exported uh, to, to China, and the more recent announcement on the Chinese side, that they would apply some export controls on the wafer of the sonar bells, what we see is an increasing rivalry which would impose more conditionality to third countries to access certain specific uh, strategic te technologies. And for the European, it means also that, in, that uh, they, may not, uh, they may not be able to rely on such an open market uh, based on, uh, on, on multilateral rules as before, as the US is adopting an industrial uh, strategy that is using, we know perfectly, a huge amount of subsidies, but local content closer to the, to the, to the Chinese uh, strategy. So it means for the European that they may have to adapt the strategy, not only based on specialization, uh, segment of, uh, of technological supply chains, but they have to increase uh, they, they own coverage of the supply chains and to increase their they, 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 they capacity. This is really an important framework for the whole res uh, European response to, to ERA. And now if we go back to uh, the proposal of the European Commission, what we have on the table is first of all the Green Deal industrial plan, but we also have the temporary crisis uh, and transition framework uh, paper, which is not yet on the table, but which has leaked and which is providing some new ele interesting elements on what, what, what we can call the matching mechanism, which would allow the European, uh, the European side to, uh, to proportionate its, its, uh, its uh, state aid uh, to the alternative offers that business could find in some third states. So to prevent uh, the, the investment diversion that we, uh, uh, that we fear so much um, in, in the EU. And the focus uh, of the debates those past uh, weeks and days and, and which is dividing the member states is really focused on the state aid flexibility perspective. But first of all, I think it's important to go back to an essential, uh, an essential brick of the uh, European Commission strategy, which is rather, first of all, a simplification shock 
because what business is asking uh, first of all is a simplification of the regulatory uh, framework within the internal market and to have a quicker access to, to financial support. And the, the, the proposal of the European Commission is piling up uh, different, different proposals which go from creating a one-stop sh shop in, every, in each member state to simplify the administrative uh, process to, to access those state aids, which would mean uh, one main entrance in each uh, member state. But there's also no tender for less mature industry, extension of delays for project implementation, simplification of notification processor, etc. And this is this is key because it's, it really provides legitimacy to engage into the second stage, uh, in the sequencing of this uh, strategy, which has to see with the state aid flexibility. Um, and, of, uh, uh, and of course, the, the issue which is related to, in, uh, to the increase uh, uh, of the selling of, uh, of those state aids, state aids. The second condition is, of course, what EU funding could be provided to help the, 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 the member states with, which have less financial capacity to support the industry. And, uh, and there, the, the, the proposal of the European Commission is clear. Let's, let's use the money that we still have at our, our disposal, no new vehicle to, uh, uh, for, to, to support uh, the industry. We use the current, uh, the, 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 the available money that is, that is still, uh, that can be channeled through those, those vehicles with a specific focus on the green transition. So it would mean uh, using the capacity of two, 225 billions of loans from the recovery and resilience plans, uh, 20 billions of subsidies from Repower EU, uh, 5.4 billions of the Brexit adjustment reserve, but also a better use of the investment EU plan, innovation fund, and, um, and, and of course, when we see that, there's some pending questions. Uh, first, there's one question that may uh, request uh, further uh, further details in 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 the in the in the in the plan, which would be how we can improve also the functioning of those uh, of those vehicles for for EU funding, um, because uh, we know that. Uh, they, they they have been some uh, some burden in, in in the functioning of those instruments, uh, and the question the, the 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 second question is also the use of the money. Um, how are we gonna invest uh, that money? How it's gonna be distributed? Because for the moment the scope is very broad. Uh, the ambition of the the industrial plan uh, is as as large as to to cover uh, renewable energy, but as well. Uh, green technologies, as well the carbonization of the industry and the support to uh, energy intensive industry. And it goes from, uh, from research, innovation, development and production, because the idea is precisely also to develop that capacity of, of production to, to extend our, 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 our global supply. Um, it's very ambitious. And wh where, where will be the, the, the main priorities or how to, how to improve the efficiency of this strategy by uh, organizing those, uh, those those priorities. It would probably request to have some clarification on the objective uh, mentioned by the industrial plan to set some objective for 2030 uh, and, 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 and to uh, precisely to know uh, on, on how to, to better organize this, uh, this in, in investment uh, strategy. And, uh, and of course, the question is as well, how this amount of EU funding can match with the needs, depending on those, uh, on those objectives. And that's where uh, the idea to, to create uh, a European sovereignty funds, uh, fund comes in, uh, because there's as much the idea that we may need some additional money. That was something that was mentioned last, uh, last week by Commissioner Thierry Breton himself, saying that there may be a gap of uh, 100 billions to, to match those objectives, but it would take us back to, to the objective themselves. And uh, going back to my previous commands, uh, beyond the green transition, beyond the development of those, those green technologies, there's the issue about anticipating the dependencies that we could have in other fields 
artificial intelligence, biotech, uh, supercomputers, uh, which would request some further, uh, some further investment. But of course, this idea of a European sovereignty fund is not uh, a question, I mean, won't be decided uh, in the coming days, neither uh, neither in, in uh, by the end of March at the European Council, it's something that the Commission proposed to explore at the turn of the of the next summer. To conclude, I would just like to underline a big difference between the US strategy and the European one, which is key. Uh, the EU intends to rely on an, uh, an ambitious industrial strategy, but as well on an open market. Uh, precisely because it wants to have the, capability, the, the capacity to expand its export opportunities to, to take a bigger share in, in global supply. While the US has this industrial, industrial strategy, uh, which is very ambitious, but is relying on a more protectionist uh, strategy. And, uh, and the Congress is not, uh, uh, he, he is not ready to, to negotiate some new trade agreements uh, providing more access to the to the US market and but as well opening new mar new market opportunities for the US and that is precisely something that has been underlined last week by Henry Paulson the former treasury secretary um, who was criticizing not only the risk of uh, ex uh, excessive decoupling from China but that the fact that the, the US is precisely betting on this protectionist strategy is, uh, is, is, uh, is a way to, to fire uh, itself in, in, in the foot because it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, help uh, the US to export themselves the, the technologies that they are, they, 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 they will, they, they are developing and, and will develop in, in, in the future. And, and finally, his proposal was uh, much more closer to, to the European one. Um, I, I stop here, and, and uh, so we can move to the, the Q and A session. Thank you. Thank you, Elvira, for your enlightening presentation. Uh, so, as you just said, it's going to be very challenging for the EU to have a, an EU industrial policy in the coming months or years. Um, just before the question, I would just want to announce to you that Elvira's last publication will be available uh, by the end of the day on our website, uh, only in French today, but soon in English. So we have received a few questions, if I'm not breaking my computer. Uh, so as uh, we mentioned, the competition, uh, European competition, European think that uh, this is an unfair competition uh, with the policy of China and the US. Do you think that the WTO rules are not clinically dead? But not, uh, but uh, obviously they, they uh, some, some rules seem to have become more optional. Uh, we, we know that China for a long time has been practicing some uh, distortions, uh, uh, com com competition distortions in, in, in its uh, trade policy, industrial policy, using a lot of uh, huge uh, subsidies, betting on its uh, uh, state-owned enterprises and local content requirements. Now, the fact that the US is adopting uh, the, those uh, practices and that is... Uh, uh, seem to to turn away uh, from precisely from from the WTO in the sense that its national security uh, is uh, is the priority and uh, however it, it intends to to comply with the multilateral rules uh, the notably all all the dispute settlement uh, mechanism, use uh, shouldn't prevent shouldn't prevent the United States from giving that priority to to the national uh, security so obviously uh, there is a concern about uh, the, the the evolution of this conformity after and, and the preservation of those multilateral rules thank you maybe a second question uh, what is the role of rare earth recycling in the EU strategy uh, it's it's a key element because it's a uh, uh, it's an. We know that the use of rare earth is is key as much for green technologies as for digital technologies. And as many countries in in the world, we rely very much on the imports of those uh, of those minerals, notably from China. As, I mean, there, there's a whole range of uh, strategic minerals, but for rare earth, 
China has itself a sort of monopoly on the refinery of this uh, of these elements, and that's why uh, the capacity to extract and also to refine and also to recycle uh, and, and 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 obviously to to uh, to have uh, less need to use also those elements is now really at the core of the of the European strategy. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned it at the at the end uh, of your conclusion, but do you think that this is the end of the free trade agreements that we've seen until now? Um, on the US side, they have switched from that strategy of free trade agreement uh, to the establishments of some forums to be able to uh, to discuss with third countries uh, the the adoptions of some. Uh, ambitious standards in precisely the field of those new technologies. But this is something that is limiting the, the, the US strategy because the third countries uh, don't have, uh, don't, don't necessarily see the benefit, the, uh, the, the, the benefit that they would gain from this uh, uh, closer work on, on standards. Uh, why, if there's no uh, access to markets. And for the Europeans, it really means that uh, at the same time, we have um, an additional pressure from the US is that we have a lower uh, domestic demand, which requests us to uh, uh, to access some third country markets. We need also to access some raw uh, materials that uh, that we don't have e e in the EU, and uh, and al and also to address uh, the the development of those technologies as as really as a, an opportunity. Uh, for future markets that will develop at the uh, at the international level, and meanwhile, um, let's pay attention also to uh, the, the the strategy of third countries in what we call now the global south, and more specifically, I would say, in the southeast of Asia, mm -hmm. they are very actively engaged in uh, in more economic integration and engage in new trade agreements. And that is something that is continuing to happen. So when we talk about deglobalization, this is not this is not the fact. Uh, there has been a record of uh, trade exchange uh, at the global level for 2022. What we what we witnessing is rather a reshuffling of the of the supply chain with more diversification, and that's why the EU strategy is also baiting into on this uh, uh, diversification strategy. Thank you. Um, how do you assess the range of different views within the European Council on the losing of subsidized role uh, in the industrial policy? Uh, well, I, I think that the, the debate has been uh, really focused and maybe a little twist on the, um, uh, on the initial uh, observation that some member states benefit uh, more than others from, uh, from this access to state aid. And first of all, obviously, because uh, all, the, all the member states don't have the same capacity uh, to, 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 to support the, the, the industry. Um, well, maybe if I can, if I can quote uh, what was uh, mentioned by Thierry Breton uh, last week is that we um, we shouldn't only pay attention on the volumes of the state aid which has been accessed by the member states since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, and, and since the, there has been some exemptions on the access to uh, to state aid and facilitation to access to state aid, uh, because uh, if we pay attention to the to the relation between those state aids and the GDP of the of the member states. He was mentioning that first in the rank we found Finland, and, and then we found Germany, and then we found Denmark, uh, and then further away uh, Italy, France, Spain, uh, just to mention the the, the, the ones that he uh, that he mentioned. And if we take the criteria of taxpayer money spending per in inhabitant, uh, in the ranking we first found uh, Denmark, Finland. And Germany. So it's not. Uh, it's not. Um, I mean, there's different ways to uh, to to look at this access to to state aid, and uh, and that the the condition uh, that uh, the, the the European Commission are proposing to fast to to flexibilize this access to uh, to state aid are are very stringent, and uh, and I would say we can count on Commissioner Vestager to be uh, to be very vigilant on that aspect
Yeah, we can count on our. Uh, maybe a second question. What role do you uh, use for the trade and technology council in this? How can this council can made more accountable to the debates in the European Parliament? Well, first of all, the Trade and Technological Council, um, we, we, we see that uh, precisely uh, the, the, the argument that we had between the US and the EU on the impact of the era on the EU is precisely, uh, is, is precisely showing the interest of the dialogue that we have within the 10 working groups of the, of the TTC. Uh, we, we have the task force specifically addressing uh, the, the issue uh, of the era, uh, but we see that in, in many of the work in working groups, like uh, the one focused on on, uh, on the strategic mineral supply chains uh, and, uh, and others, are addressing some issues that um, and, and that the, the 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 dialogue that is most needed on the bilateral basis between the EU and the US would would allow to uh, would allow to anticipate and to prevent precisely an escalation of disputes. And that's why the initiative taken by uh, the, the German and French uh, economy minister, minister of Economy uh, going to Washington um, yesterday and asking for some transparency um, to, to, uh, to be able to assess uh, the the uh, the offer, the, the offers that are made to the to the business in terms of uh, state aid, uh, is part of that uh, of the need of uh, of uh, dialogue and and coordination between the between the two big uh, the two big blocks, and concerning of course uh, the the relation with the the European Parliament, um, what we see that is that in the, in the TTC. Uh, it, it's not a, it's not a negotiation like in a in a trade agreement, uh, but there's there's more and more uh, strategic issues uh, that are that are discussed that may, may that may justify also to have a, a stronger involvement of the European Parliament. I think you, you just mentioned that France and Germany are very proactive, but which country in the EU might have less interest in having a new industrial strategy? How do you convince them to move to that direction? I, I think all the, all, all the member states are concerned because precisely it's about uh, providing to all the EU member states access to some, uh, to some technologies which, which may not be uh, so accessible in the next future, or which which mean which uh, for 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 which uh, there would be a, a high price of conditionality added to the to to this access. So the the, the idea is really to switch from only uh, fair competition between between member states to more mutualization of capacities between the member states, but on the basis of an open market, uh, which means. Uh, uh, which means uh, equipping uh, the the member states and the uh, and the whole EU to uh, to engage in uh, in uh, in a more level playing field in more level playing field at the international level. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it the EU industrial policy affordable, considering the debt situation of some member states and the fragmentation of the EU single market? According to you. Uh, that's uh, that's the whole uh, that's the whole challenge, and that's why the whole the the the, the EU funding is a uh, is a uh, is a key one, and uh, and that's why uh, we um, it's one thing in the sequencing of this strategy to start with uh, the available EU funding capacity, uh, but we cannot avoid to address the issue about a new uh, a, a, a new uh, uh, a new instrument for for more European uh, share uh, capacity of uh, of debt, which would alleviate uh, the, the 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 member states, which are uh, at the moment um, uh, have I mean have to 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 couple with the, this uh, heavy weight of uh, debt, public debt.
Uh, thank you. And maybe one last question on China, uh, which is one of your uh, expertise, the relationship of European Union to China. Um, so as, as mentioned earlier, uh, China, European Union has a lot of dependency on China. We've seen with the COVID-19, for example, on uh, medicine, uh, with the mask. So how do you think that the EU should respond now to the rivalry between the US and China and how it's positioned itself as an autonomous strategic uh, actor? Is it possible or are we always going to be on the third part? Well, uh... Th th this um, th this industrial strategy is precisely a response. The EU has to uh, needs to have its own response to, to to China. And first of all, a key a key element, a key step, is really to uh, to identify our, our specific dependencies uh, with China to reduce those dependencies. There's a whole work that has already been done by the European Commission identifying. Uh, 137 products on which we have a specific dependency. Uh, we need to to uh, we we need to assess more carefully uh, what what and to, to try to delimit uh, the, the 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 dependencies on which we have to 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 reduce obviously the dependencies of Chinese imports, but also to consider how to balance that with the dependencies that China has. With the with the European imports and with the access to the European market, because uh, China is uh, is uh, selling much more to the European market to than than uh, than, the, than the reverse, and it's also a leverage that we can uh, use and uh, and continue uh, engaging also to to have more access to the to the Chinese market on more level playing field conditions. Well, thank you very much, Elvia, for your presentation and all these answers. Uh, thank you to you for following today your question. We will send you the replay later this afternoon. The next euro question will be held in French on Wednesday, February 22nd. We will have the pleasure to welcome Nicole Niesotto, the Vice President of the Jacques Delors Institute. She will come back to us uh, on the Europe Defense Review one year af after the war in Ukraine. Thank you again and have a nice afternoon. Merci, Elvire.